winter like today. It'll be fantastic. You're going to give them directions or so instructions? Okay. Okay, for those of you people that are on Zoom, can you all hear me? I'm going to share my screen and show you where to go get the sermon. I'm not going to share the sermon on the screen, okay? But I'm going to share how you go get the sermon and you can read from there. You ready? Sandy, are you watching? <laughs> Oh, you've got the sermon. Good. Yeah, I have it, Kristen. I, I, I not only wait, 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 not only do I have it, I can I, I um, put it in two different links so I can read it at the same time. Rather, if people want to do that, you can open it You're up in two different ways. Awesome, awesome. Okay, for all the rest of you who need to know how to go get it, you go to our Countryside website, which is countrysideucc.org. Can you see my little arrow up here? Mm -hmm. And it looks like this when you get here. And then under the learning together tab right here, can you see that? You draw this down. And Center for Face Studies is right here. So you look under Center for Face Studies. And you get this window. And the very first face you see is the rabbi. Got it? Mm -hmm. And then right here, these links under where it says class for October 26th is canceled due to weather. Underneath that, these links are here. But now our dates, uh, we're going forward with our regular dates. So the sermon we're dealing with today is the one that says November 2nd. See where it says download December 2nd materials here? You click that link and there's the sermon. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Everybody got that? Yes. Okay. Okay, we can start, huh? Yeah. Okay, I'm not I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, so you'll have to go get the sermons yourselves. All right. Okay, bye. <laughs> I'll now mute my screen so that it won't uh, echo back on you guys' hearing. Uh, good morning. Good to see everyone. Don't forget your text on the table. Okay. Sit down, feel comfortable. So uh, the topic, the topic of uh, this sermon, can you hear me out there? What? Yeah, the mask. I'm taking the mask off. Uh, it's, it's a topic that uh, we all think about from time to time. Hopefully, hopefully uh, we are able to, uh, to achieve it. But I look, at, uh, I look at the challenge of living in freedom and what is freedom. Uh, what is really a freedom? Because in, in, in Judaism, uh, a lot of the text in the Jewish Bible is about being a slave. The whole book of Exodus, the desire to be free. What is real, r really freedom? How, do, how does one feel that they are free? Uh, do we feel 
uh, that we enjoy complete freedom uh, in the United States. I mean, it's a good topic to talk about the day before the elections. Uh, we, all, we all pay a lot of taxes. We work most of our life to accumulate that money to pay taxes. Is this freedom? So I, I wanted to explore that topic. And um, I started, so the name of the sermon is The Never-Ending Journey to Freedom. I, I think that this is a constant work that we need to uh, make sure that we are on that path that will guarantee and give us freedoms that sometimes we take completely for granted. Uh, look outside, look at all those children. They look completely free. Are we jealous? Nothing is bothering them. Do we want to go back to that level of free to do whatever you want to do? Uh, you know, is it really freedom when you can, you can do whatever you want to do? Is there freedom then? Or maybe that also is in a way of slavery. So I, you'll see the three concepts that I laced down the sermon, but I'll start with this uh, story, Midrashic story, the beginning of the sermon. Uh, there once was a wise man who opened a perfume shop for his son on the streets that was frequent by prostitutes. Yeah, so the Jewish texts have a lot of stories about prostitutes. Why not? Uh, they are challenging. So the man opened a store for perfume in that on that street. So uh, the women on the street made a fine profit. The perfume shop did its share. And the young shopkeeper, as an indirect result of his profitable business, feel that we say fell into evil ways. I mean, when you open a shop in a street that is frequent by prostitute, uh, chances are that what? They'll shop there. A what? That they'll shop there. They will shop there. They will. <laughs> they will join. He joined the party. Uh, it was. Uh, it was a good business. <laughs> so, uh, when the father came and found his uh, son in the midst of prostitute, he began to shout, "I'm going to kill you!" Uh, but a friend of his was there, and he, he interceded on behalf of the son and said, you were the means of destroying the character of your son. And yet you shouted at him. You ignored other professions and told him to be a perfumer. And you passed other locations only to open the shop on the street where the prostitutes live and work. So the friend actually accused the father for allowing the son to go into bad habits. Now this is brought there because of the connection to the idol worshiping. I mean, what is the first transgression that the Israelites are doing when they left e Egypt? What is the major transgression that they need to ask forgiveness? What happened? Yeah. Yeah, they built a golden calf. The golden calf was a disaster because they assumed the golden calf will take them out of Egypt into the promised land. So they worship the golden calf. So God got angry. So the Midrash tells God, relax, you are the reason for them having a golden calf. They are not at fault. They were in Egypt all those years. They were slaves according to, good morning. They were uh, slaves according to a tradition for 430 years. It took them 430 years yeah. according to a Jewish tradition no. to leave Egypt. 
and huge and current. Yeah. It was? Yeah. Did I hear anyone? But it's too early. Right. And Naylor, I think you need to mute yourself. Yeah. Oh, no! <laughs> it's okay. We'll wait for all of you to mute yourself, or maybe... Okay, it's fixed. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak without background noise. Uh, so that's exactly what the story is about. The story about the streets of prostitute is that sometimes we fall into habits as a result of where we are opening our shop. Give me some other equivalents, other example. Why is it so important before we open a shop on a street to make sure that there is no ways to fall into traps? Yeah. In some communities, um, children at a young age are used as drug runners. Yeah. And uh, the lack of parental supervision or whatever, um, they eventually become drug dealers themselves. Yeah. Oh, I have to. Okay, so the comment the comment was made about uh, children being used as a drug runners, and they fall into this uh, a profession that leads them to some. Yeah, to be drug runners, to to use the drugs. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's a story that really comes to defend the Israelites for creating the golden calf. It's really saying to God, what do you expect them to do? That's what they're used to watch in Egypt. They were part of the Egyptian culture, which worshipped idols. And that's why they created this idol. While, remember the story when Moses goes up to the mountain, he comes down with the Ten Commandments and he sees the people dancing around the golden calf, uh, which was built by Aaron. Aaron, his brother, not knowing when Moses will come back from the mission of the, uh, having the commandments come down from the mountain, wanted to earn some time and diffuse the anxiety on the part of the Israelites, not knowing what to do. They were left alone there on the bottom of the mountain. This is after they left Egypt, really with no direction, with no leadership. And so they fell into this trap of the building of the golden calf. And then they called the golden calf, this is our God. And they expected the golden calf to lead them out of the desert into the promised land. In Jewish tradition, that transgression is a severe transgression. Uh, but the punishment was also severe. Do you know what happened to those people? Well, you have to go back to Exodus. Not a good ending. They were all killed. Not all the Israelites, by the way. Around 15,000 people were involved in building the Golden Cave. They all got wiped out. <coughs> A what? Oh, thank you. Can you hear me well out at home? Can you hear everything I'm saying? Okay. Yes, thank we you. can. So now, uh, I'm going to the bottom of the first page. I, I wrote down, although most of us try to do our best and to be our best, we must struggle daily to free ourselves from negative influences, impulses. I mean, this is the daily struggle that we have and how are we doing? Are we capable to win over our impulses? How do we do that? Badly, you have to pick up the mask for the nose. You have to cover your nose. No, I think most of us are doing okay. I, I mean, 
Are we doing okay? Are we winning the war against the evil impulses? So in Judaism, we have two impulses. We have the good impulse and the evil impulse, and they reside inside of us. So you'll never hear a Jew say, the devil made me do it. It's such a poor excuse. We want, we want to be able to be strong and to be able to control our impulses. And both evil impulse and are needed in the struggle. Uh, if you have only good impulses, you're boring. You have to have something that will nudge you, that will pull you sometimes because the character is created as a result of the struggle. If someone only have, if we, will, if we only had the good impulse, uh, I think we will never know really how to overcome evil impulses. So the Jewish tradition takes it for granted that we have both of those impulses. And we need to figure out how to win them, how to win one that is the better one, the one that is the better part of us, of who we are. So we call it evil, good and evil inclination. You see, it's even a nice word, inclination. Inclination doesn't mean that we're going to live, immerse ourselves completely in one or the other impulses. We see this as a constant struggle is inside of us. We have the capacity, we have the power to get the evil impulse. I don't think anyone can get rid completely from the evil impulse. It's always there. I'm sorry, bad news. I know. It's there. There's not, the only thing to do with evil impulse is to make it as small as possible. To make sure that you control it, that you tame it. And not to allow for the evil impulses inside of us to uh, win. So uh, I go to the page two and I start listing the three ingredients in Judaism that offer us a pathway to freedom. And I start with first one, knowledge. Why is knowledge an important ingredient to be able to taste, enjoy freedom in our lives? Why is knowledge so important? The pursuit of knowledge. One three one three zero is the password. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, how are they going to join if all of them are muted? Whoever iPhone is, you need to mute yourself. All right, those of you that heard my question are welcome to participate in the conversation from from afar. I. I think that knowledge is the first thing, because if you can't own something, you know, I, I think about Carl Jung and, and he talks about the shadow parts of us, that if we can't own and acknowledge and know that something's there, it's hard to even uh, go anywhere with it. Like if you're completely in denial that something exists, then how do you, face those inclinations and change. Yeah, so for example, so I'll repeat this, uh, the example of knowledge to be able to pursue and understand uh, and answer to some of the shadowy parts of our life. I mean, uh, here is a great example, the way they treated, and I, I heard that he's gonna be fired after the election the chief scientist, Fauci. Fauci. I mean, science, for example, uh, can help tremendously in clearing some of the questions 
when it came to the plague. Uh, it will be it will be a sad day when Fauci is going to be fired. But we just heard a promise from the president uh, that that's what he will do after the elections. I, I'm surprised that he is waiting for the election to be over. I mean that's a, that's a terrible statement for those of us who every day open the newspaper or, or turn the TV on to hear the news about the, the disease, the illness. Uh, how many of you check in the morning to see how many people got sick in Nebraska? Yeah, we all do this. That's how we go. Uh, so knowledge, so I put down the explanation of knowledge. All of us have at one time or another engaged in some form of academic pursuit, disciplining ourselves to hour of study so we can read and write or forego immediate pleasure in life to master somebody, some body of knowledge. What happens when we pursue knowledge? How are we becoming more free as a pursuit of knowledge? Yes. I would say to, to know is to love. And that the love is what makes us most human. So it's the combination of love comes from knowing. And that's the way I see the book. Okay, so knowledge and then love. You'll see that the love is the second ingredient here in the bottom of the page. I, I put love separate from knowledge. Uh, our academic achievements to a large degree are both symbols and products of our intelligence, of our creativity, and of a hard and diligent work. If we seek knowledge, however, only out of vanity, serving only to make ourselves grandiose, we corrupt the discipline and we become slaves. So the pursuit knowledge for the right reasons of knowing in order to be able to achieve wisdom you, you, dropped, you dropped your phone down on the floor, yeah. Okay. Uh, knowledge that does not improve the world or make it a better place is selfishness taken to an extreme. And we become slaves when our ambitions are purely selfish. There will always be someone smarter, someone more learned than us, someone with a new idea that contradicts our own or just take away the limelight. If we use the pursuit of knowledge of our own gain, to our own gain, we will be forced to run a never ending treadmill that will isolate, enslave, and bitter us. So it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be pursuing knowledge for myself, my sake alone, but to be able to share it, to also understand that there are other people uh, in our company that also are knowledgeable. And so knowledge for the sake of improving the world, not just knowledge for the sake of improving myself. So that's when knowledge is done in this way, freedom is available. We, we become free of, from uh, idol worshiping. We become free from all kinds of theories that are not relevant to our lives uh, by learning, by also sharing the knowledge, we improve the world around us. And that's how you get to a level of freedom as a result of it. So the second one I wrote down is love. Uh, 
a healthy love and the acceptance, support and nourishment that comes along with it is one of the basic needs of, of all humans share in common. From the moment we are born, the quality of our lives and the stability of our emotions is largely, largely determined by the quality and nature of our relationship with significant other people. If we receive the right amount of love from our parents, for instance, we build positive concepts and are prepared to navigate through this world in a productive way on our own. Our love meets are in balance. We are then free to love ourselves and free to establish mutually beneficial love relationship with others. What, what is love giving us? I mean, all of us have been and hopefully you are still in relationship of love. What is the love to this church, for example, is doing to people? Love. You can you can remove it a little bit. Love generally gives you security, most of all. That you are you can be secure in yourself because you have love from someone else. They respect you and um, and help you uh, become more loving, maybe to the rest of the world or the other people in your life. It's a mutually um, enhancing. Uh, ingredient. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the the comment was about uh, love that creates, especially if you get it getting it from other people, that love establishes strength, creates strength inside of us. We we are we know better who we are when we receive this kind of love from people to validate ourselves. So knowledge, love. Um, Carol Adams wrote on Zoom chat. Oh, I can't, I can't see. The, For me, enlightenment opens my mind and my heart. Okay, there is a comment on the a chat. Uh, from who? From Carol? Carol from, from Carol, that uh, enlightenment, re repeat again. Enlightenment opens my mind and my heart. Wonderful. Enlightenment. Uh, which I assume is parallel to love, but it's also knowledge, opens the mind and the heart. Any, any other comment from people who are sitting in their homes? Can we talk or are we supposed to not talk? <laughs> you know, please talk. Well, I think that um, a healthy love brings out the best in us. So whether that be a marriage or um, a congregation that you um, are a member of or whatever, that a healthy love brings out the best in us so that we're, uh, we can be our best selves. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, this, we can be the best of ourselves when we feel that love. It can be marriage. It can be the church. It can be our children. Uh, it can be any kind of relationship. I think the, the group that studies together, uh, there is this pursuit of knowledge and also the respect that we feel about other people in this room that are pursuing similar knowledge to what we are trying to do. We feel good about that. We're not alone. Rabbi? Rabbi? Please, Sandy. Uh, um, yeah. So it, going back to the beginning of what you were talking about. Can you about, speak up? Speak it, up a little. Going back to what you began with, which is we both all have the inclinations, both, both good and evil inside of us, without love. Lo love is the other, the other side of love is hate. And if love is there in abundance and we are all supported with it, it really does help to um, mitigate those inclinations toward hate. Beautiful, yeah. Love definitely uh, is capable of conquering 
the evil inclination inside of us. Uh, again, we will never be able to get rid completely of the evil inclination. Actually, there is a story in Jewish tradition that the rabbis wanted to get rid of the evil inclination. So they captured the evil inclination and put the evil inclination in jail. But for three days, there was no weddings. No one fell in love with anyone. Uh, there was no competition. There was no capitalism. Uh, the evil inclination was arrested and put aside. But then after three days, when nothing happened in the world, because evil inclination helped energize the, war, the world too, they decided to free the evil inclination, but decided to take one eye of the evil inclination. So the evil inclination will not be so busy in making havoc in our lives. It's a story, it's a legend. But, they, but we cannot live just all the time with good inclination. Why is that? Why do we need to have the evil inclination even in a small measure? Why, why is it important to acknowledge that you also need to have the evil inclination in action. Why? Yes. I think you grow when you have challenges in front of you. And I think that helps help stimulate your desire to grow as a person. So you, you, need, you need to have some, some kind of a stimulation. A you, challenge, uh, but to keep it in control. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, all of us, uh, all of us have done the golden calves in different times in our life. We are, we are constantly, uh, I, I think this coming election tomorrow uh, shows the measurement of the golden calves that we are building now in our lives. It'll be nice to be the days after. How many of us want finally this period to end? Yeah, all of us, all of us. And when you think about the amount of money that is invested in promotion of candidates, and what can we do with that money to put it to a good work, we can solve so many issues in our society if we take the money and invest it in the right place. Why do we have to spend so many billions of dollars for what we Why can't we just know who is running and make a choice? Why do we have someone is elected to be a senator or a congressperson, already they need to start raising money for the next campaign? Why? I, I have a, a response yeah. to the negativity yes. or yes. the inclination, negative inclination. They all hear you, beautiful, yeah. Can you, you all can hear me now too, so that's good. Um, I think it's something that's innate in all of us in some ways, we have that negative inclination and if we don't recognize it and name it, then even our really good ideas and inclinations when taken too far, go to the negative side. And if you don't recognize it, you don't know when to stop. Absolutely. So I've seen that happen with people with really terrific, great intentions end up having very negative impacts on people, impacts that hurt people, even though they would never in a million years want to hurt anybody, yeah. right? But they, they don't, they're not watching their negative inclination and their positive stuff is, has been so boxed in that it becomes a negative thing. Yeah. And, and that, if you don't ever acknowledge it or know that it exists or recognize it or say you have the capacity, you can never forgive it in other people and you can never forgive it in yourself. Beautiful. Chris, I, I, I really, I really agree with that. I, I, think it, I think it really speaks to the fact um, right there about how important it is that we have boundaries, that we understand there are boundaries. And, and we acknowledge those boundaries in all levels of our lives, internally and externally. 
America's boundaries, laws, whatever you want to put around that are so important. I think I really agree with that. Yeah, so this is, for example, the reason why Bar Mitzvah and Bat Mitzvah is at age 13. The rabbis have all understood that by age 13, the evil inclination is being created inside of the boys or the girls. And that's a good place, age 13, to be able to start educating the kids. And, and I mean, you start from young, young age, but that's an age where people can make choices. So if you want to be able to contain the evil inclination, that's the place where you need to start providing the other side, the good inclination. So that's why the study of mitzvot, commandments, is important for that age. So the child, the child is supposed to have a project of helping society. So they take all kinds of assignments upon them to, to be able to discover the goodness that they have inside. Uh, again, the rabbis never wanted to get completely rid of evil inclination. It's in, learn how to live with this, make sure that you are encapsulated the evil inclination in some way, and make sure the other inclination is well and alive and energetic and the goodness is there. Okay, now comes the third reason of how to achieve freedom. So we have two, one was knowledge and the other one was love. And now comes the third one, which is belief. Why is belief important in the road to achieve freedom? Why is belief important? Please. The objects. The first encounter the things through our senses. We get the ideas through our mind or our spirit. And so the ideas have a certain kind of preciousness above and beyond the senses and the feelings. The feelings come out of the body. The senses come into the, into the body. Uh, and that process occurs, and then out of the blend of the senses and feelings or emotions, emotion, by the way, means exit, movement from the body. And so those emotions and those are turned into uh, thoughts, and those thoughts are then created by words. And so then we see the idea of the beginning and the Mm. That's my opinion. Thank you. How do you summarize this? <laughs> it's hard to summarize. I think you can summarize it rather quickly. If you first think, sense, feel, thought. Sense, feel, thought. And then the thought becomes a word, which is the language which basically means or tongue. And so then you have a process of the intellect unfolding. And so this is the process in my mind of becoming a human. Okay, how I would do that or summarize that is how I often teach my um, classes for small groups is that you have a certain belief in in what feels good to you and what helps you become who you are, where your values are, where your boundaries are, where all those things are. 
But if you are not acting in that belief or able to articulate that belief to somebody else, bringing that word out there, um, then the wholeness of that experience is something that you never actually experience. So uh, the, the idea of our small groups here at Countryside, for example, are safe places, small groups that you get to trust the people that you're with so you can practice becoming most fully who you are by articulating your faith, by taking missteps in ways that other people can help see who you are and help you become what you really believe in. You, you, in, in, in effect, you actualize yourself in the midst of the group. Yes. That's why, that's why, that's, that's why in Judaism, for example, there's a prohibition against living a community. One needs to be active in a community in order to discover the, the full power of who they are. So if it, so many people are uh, not interested in creating community around them, or and one of the ways of creating community is by having faith and joining a group of people in order to better yourself. So the work of the community and the individual is essential to be able to test, test my values, test my beliefs, test things that will allow me to become better. Let me, let me suggest, here's what I, I wrote as part of it. This basic freedom has never been taken from, for granted by the Jewish people for we have experienced much pain and suffering at the hands that have tried to impose their beliefs and dog dogmas on us to enslave us with their pre prejudices. So part of Jewish history is constantly fighting people and ideas and countries that try to impose on us Jews their beliefs. So we 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 extremely strong by having a set of beliefs that was able to resist those temptations. When you are constantly living in an environment where your beliefs are tested regularly or you are pushed into observing things that contradict your belief, it helps you, you, the religion, the Jewish religion, to grow up and sustain itself. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that we beat all the odds in Las Vegas of still being here. Think about this. With everything that happened to the Jewish people, we are only 15 million people in the world. And it seems that the world is so busy with us. What, I mean, this kind of a history that created a lot of traumas and also created great losses of people. That's why, for example, a Jewish family is commanded after the Holocaust always to have one more child to replace all the kids that were killed in the Holocaust. Actually, we, we are aware of this. This was something that I was told by my parents. Uh, I, I didn't fulfill this. I have two kids. But all the kids that grew up at Temple, I look at them as my kids. So that's how I try to overcome not fulfilling this commandment. But a lot of people are taking it seriously. Yeah, we have all of our kids. Yeah, we have all the kids here. Uh, we, we know how precious and how fragile the free, freedom of belief is. But we can also become slaves to our own beliefs. We can close our minds to new ideas and we can avoid or imagine certain truths about ourselves and our world 
if we refuse to accept objective realities. We pass up many opportunities for growth when we do this. I, one of the amazing gifts of the tri faith is this openness. You cannot imagine what it does with some of the people in the different faith communities. I think we are getting stronger in knowing what our faith is because we need to explain it to our, I'm, I'm talking as a church member now, to explain church to Jewish people in the synagogue or the mosque and the life of Muslims makes the worshipers and the faith believers become stronger in acquiring knowledge about their faith because they need to be the teachers. They need to explain. And it makes us move into a different, more educated level of being able to talk to our Jewish or Muslim friends. Do you, do you find this happening in, in your life? Yeah, please. strong as our weakest link and valuing and appreciating that difference is um, what makes the whole beautiful so there is definitely a strength coming as a result of prevent the wicked sling and you become weak when you, you're lazy, lazy, when, when nothing is interesting, when you are drowning in your own stuff without acknowledging that there are truths and realities that need to be embraced and accepted. I mean, this, this uh, ability to live in a country where there is a complete separation between church and state I see this as a major gift for my people. How do you guys feel about this? Is this something you desire? You guys desire as Christians to have a complete separation? Or maybe, maybe this should be the religion of America. Many people in America think that the religion of America is Christianity. Yes. Think it's, their it's their Christianity. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, the, the, official? the official religion. No, I mean the, uh, the, the official Christian stance on that is that, uh, for me anyway, uh, is that the separation of church and state is a be of benefit to the churches not to the state. I agree. And uh, it's there to protect us, to be able to have our faith in our way so that no one can tell us how we have to believe. And therefore then we have to grant that same freedom to others. So this whole pluralism project is something that allows us to say that our good intentions are that we're free to be Christians, but then we also then have to allow Muslims free to be Muslims and Absolutely. Jews free to be Jews. Absolutely. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and be able to say that God is revealed outside of our boundaries of what we think is right and what we think is wrong, and, and allow God to be the one in charge of all that instead of us setting up rules and regulations about who's allowed to have faith and who's not. And that's what the Constitution guarantees through the faith. Yeah. It is, it, so it's not it's not the separation of church and state in that you can't have prayer in school. It's just that you can't have only one prayer in school. You have to have all prayers in school. You have to be able to legitimize things. And, and they think that's too messy, so they don't bother at all. If it's not their religion, it's nobody's religion. And, and that, I think, is, is where the breakdown is. The right-wing majority, moral majority now, is saying that it has to be the proper religion in order for it to be acceptable 
And that's not at all what the constitutional writers were trying to do. I totally agree. I think if it was no separation of church and state, we will not have the tribe. Yeah. Any, yes. Wonderful, okay. wonderful. Economy, religion, government. Science and art. Yes. Yeah, and all of them need to thrive at the same time. You can you can neglect any of them. So, Chris, can you repeat again? Just a second. Repeat again those four. Okay, I put it in the chat as well for those of you on Zoom. But our speaker was saying that there are four essential um, institutions that are needed in any society for a society to thrive and they were religious priests pastors kind of people uh economy which is the hunter gatherer kind of thing uh government as somebody is the leadership in charge of helping gather people together in community and science and art is celebrating life itself in the unknown and the discovery so instead of instead of uh, talking about separation of church and state so that's how you so the state for you is those four items and the stronger they are the healthier the state becomes the community becomes The power of this government, yeah. In order to create a healthy society. Yeah. Ann Naylor has a question online. Say it again. I have a question, Rabbi. Okay, please ask. I'm going. I'm going way back to what we were talking about, what you were talking can about. You, can Take you, off your can mask, you, Anne. Okay. We've got people in the house. Oh, so, okay. Um, I'm going back to your uh, comments about 
10 minutes ago when you were talking about, um, so poignantly talking about what it's like for in their beliefs because they're challenged all the time. And this is my question. My journey group is reading Amy Jill Levine's book, Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. And in the book, she talks a lot about Jesus being a Jew and she goes back and forth between the Old Testament and the New Testament and how they are the same. And so um, she, she is, is laying the groundwork that Judaism for Christians and Muslims is really our bedrock foundation. We come out of Judaism. So my question is, yeah. Did you ever think of us as offspring? Because I'm starting to realize, and maybe I'm just coming late to this game, probably, but I'm starting to realize more, uh, I don't know how to say this exactly, my Jewishness. I'm starting to appreciate more my Jewish heritage. And I've been raised Christian, do you, but do you understand what I'm saying? I, I understand. I, I think she's, uh, uh, she's telling the truth in that book. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's how people need to see themselves. How, how, oh. My question, though, is how yeah. do you see, how, how do Jews see Christians? Do, do Jews see Christians as being part of your tradition? I, I, th I think that that's the way to look at Christians by Jews. Uh, not replacement. Right. But continuation. Right. But the question is, the question is, how do Christians see themselves? I mean, the way I look at it, would not make Christians look at themselves the same way. You ask me as a Jew. So I think, I think that Judaism is extremely important for the Christian and the Christian needs to learn and spend some time. And I think this is what I'm doing here. I, I, I'm generously invited here to be able to teach about Judaism. I think in the long run, this will be a solid piece of knowledge that you guys will embrace and enjoy. Yes. I, I want to speak to that too, Anne, because um, the Tri-Faith is recently did their opening, their grand opening, and they had a play that they wrote. And they represented all the different faiths in that play about uh, having conversations with strangers and all that kind of stuff. And it was, it was a fabulous presentation. But there's been pushback right. from a lot of different people saying that the only representation of Christianity in that play was a very negative, closed-minded, evangelical kind of Christianity, and it doesn't represent us at all. Right. And so to say that that is the norm for Christianity is not necessarily true. And there, there have been, you know, we've missed opportunities of saying that there is so much more to Christianity than that, and yet it wasn't spoken. Right. So how, how then can we as Christians ourselves then say, how do we articulate our own faith? What is it that brings us joy about who we are? Eric often talks about the tri-faith as being siblings rather than right. Oh, okay. Different well, gods, but reveal, I mean, same God, but revealed in different ways, just as you have different re relationships with your parents from your siblings. So that might be a better expression rather than an offspring awesome. kind of situation yeah, really um, but i would invite all of you who are here in the room as well to start thinking about how do you articulate your particular belief within the tri-faith conversation and realize that whenever i speak about christianity i always 
tell people that there's a huge spectrum of understanding within Christianity and that I often disagree much more with other Christians than I do with Jews or Muslims. Um, that is true, by the way, in Judaism too. Right. We have, Judaism is uh, Jews, not Judaism, it's more complex. And so when we have these kind of plays, we, or things like that that come up out of the tri-faith, we as Christians needs to stand up and say, that doesn't represent us. And we need to have those conversations in a way that say, it might represent some Christians, but not all Christians are like that. So to put it out there as a ongoing conversation about who the tri-faith is, is not fair to all of us. So we have to have those conversations about, um, are what we are accepting as uh, a portrayal of what Judaism is about, is that really what Judaism is about? Or are we talking to other Jews and saying, well, a rabbi told me this. What do you think about that? Is that your expression of Judaism? Um, the imam represents uh, Islam in a way that I know several other Muslims that don't represent it that way. So there's, there's going to be an open conversation all the time. And that's the part where we need safe places to not judge each other about what's right or what's wrong, but rather open ourselves to the whole of the conversation and say, how does that help us in practicing conversation in a way that we become a conversation that's open to exploring what else is out there? Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Beautiful. And, and we need to be able to write better plays. <laughs> Well, and not accept them just because they come from our partners. We can say that we think this misrepresents us. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I, I don't, don't think I was satisfied with uh, all the Jewish expressions at the play. I mean, it's, it, it's, I think it was good to create some kind of a conversation, mm -hmm. but we need to be able to write plays for everyone to feel comfortable. And I don't think it will ever happen. Well, and I think the plays or whatever we t speak about on, on as tri-faith, we need to speak about our own experiences of what it means to be in this place. Because other interfaith conversation is not going to be necessarily our conversation. So what we're getting from the tri-faith office often is what else is happening out there, which is great because we need to hear that. that but we're not also then expressing who we are here in this place to them. And so this play that's been written is gonna be seen by other people as what's happening here. And that's not at all what's happening here. So that's, that was my, I was kind of disappointed in that play from the Tri-Faith. And I've heard that now from several other people, but it is not that it's wrong because what it does does do is invite people to come together and be in conversation about their beliefs, and that's a good thing. Well, it also allows us to critique it. Right, but then we can stand up now and say, this is not the piece that needs to go forward to represent who we are. We need a different piece, and then we need to talk about what that might look like and actually create it ourselves so that they can use it. And maybe, I, maybe I this has to be created by members of this church. Exactly. To be able to write the full expression, but you'll have challenges here too if you try to do it. Well, but Even the thing is, is that they can't represent Christianity without bringing people from this Christian community into that conversation. And we would never try to write something or preach something that didn't include somebody from these congregations to help uh, show us their faith and their belief so that we can say, well, I have other friends that wouldn't say that about Judaism, but I'm glad to hear your version of that and tell me where is that grounded and how does that inform our Christianity? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, can I, can oh. I say something about that? Yes, say it. Um, the the just, person just that wrote that, um, oh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, the, yeah, Gail, so go, the, the person that wrote that, I know her mother well, and um, she was, had a background in destructive evangelical, not good Christianity. And I think that her, um, her perspective was more to point out to people who believe that they're not being biased 
that that isn't what Christianity is about and that maybe they should look at themselves. And unfortunately, I don't think she did represent the Jesus following Christianity that your church represents and Trifaith represents. Perhaps there should have been another character um, in the story uh, because just well like what Aria and Chris said, within Judaism, within Islam, within Christianity, um, people yeah, don't yeah, have Well, maybe you should start writing that piece. Write yeah. that character. You should write that character. I mean, what's, I mean, this is the purpose of those conversations, to discover, to discover the ga gap between us, acknowledge it, accept it, but continue talking and teaching. It's all about knowledge. And curiosity. And curiosity, you're right. Yes. <laughs> that's my need for more expansive. If it would have been the multi faith, <sighs> how many would have gotten into the problem of the Tower of Babel? Because one of the problems that happens here is when you get so many voices, you can no longer make sense of anything. So now we are at it, uh, and being humans, we are trying to find some kind. Yeah, so uh, I, I think it'll be uh, of great benefit if each faith community that is involved in the tri-faith will sit down and, and write and create the, the belief system that maintain the community together. I mean, what, when you say countryside, what are you saying? when they say Temple Israel, what are we saying? The same is true with the mosque. I mean, some kind of a coherent uh, belief, I believe, needs to be written by each of the communities. And this can be a wonderful uh, material to be able to study about each other. I mean, is there, I mean, who creates the background for the faith community to survive? How much are the members of this church involved in creating this? Or maybe this is something that needs to be administered from the pulpit by the minister. Yeah, both end. So I think this is something that needs to be evaluated in each institution. We have to do it. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, uh, I, I want to finish. It's already uh, 10, 10 or 4. So, oh, 11, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We have fun when the time goes by. I'm going to the bottom of page four. Uh, these freedoms I have outlined, knowledge, love, believe, must be carefully protected as we move along the paths of our lives, for they can all be easily corrupted. At every turn, at every moment, we must be prepared to choose between slavery and freedom to choose between serving ourselves alone and serving humanity, between narcissism 
and love for all people. It's a very narrow bridge to walk on. We are compelled to walk through a wilderness of selfishness, idolatry, and self-doubt, but we have the power and the ability to free ourselves to make better choices for our lives. The road which we travel to freedom is largely, largely unprotected. It requires vigilance and will and a clearer understanding of our place on this earth. Our presence here, uh, I, I wrote it for the Jews of Temple Israel, our but I'll change the word here. Our presence here in the tri-faith community, perhaps evidence of our will. It is a step in the right direction. It took our ancestors 40 years to reach the promised land, to be free, yet, yet the past continues in every generation. We, we cannot separate ourselves from the past. So when we come to this conversation of who we are at the present, we need to look also backward. Yes. I would just close with my own remark with the idea that we began with from, freedom from, and I would say we are in the road of freedom to. And so the two preferences is the process of where we are. The but they're also, the, you're suggesting this as the core of our discussion. That's right. Yeah. Yes. That's all. Wonderful. Uh, any, any... For those of you on Zoom, he, what he said was, um, we're in the process of, of um, being freed from something in order to become something else, freed for or toward an, a new reality. Right? Beautiful. That was my entire race sermon in August. You can go back and watch that. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, one more chance for uh, remarks from the floor here or from, from the places where you are. Any summations? Okay. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Thank you, RA. Have a good day. Next, uh, next week again, the same time, the same place, mm -hmm. the same yeah. computers. And for all of you online, um, if you, all the, the um, sermons that we're using in this series are up on that same site that where you got the sermon for today at Countryside's Center for Faith Studies page. Okay, so you can go and get them anytime and reread them or pre-read them so that you can be in conversation every Monday. Okay. Thank you. That's, thanks, bye. That's also true for all of you online. Uh, we print them every week to have them out here, but uh, you can go online and download it yourself and, and read them, pre-read them if you want. They're all there online. The advantage, the advantage of uh, this work of Tri-Faith is for sermons of the rabbi are on the website of the church. Yes. That's already messianic time, isn't it? And this, this week's Torah portion, Lech Lech, Lech Lecha, Lech Lecha. Which, it, which maybe there was uh, something that Rabbi Berenson put on about the four different ways of talking about the journey and who 